Okay, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Deep Rock. Thanks for, thanks for coming. So today is the first class of the semester. And uh, um, this is a course being co-taught in two institutions. So I'll be teaching at Minnesota. There are instructors at Michigan as well. Um, I'll give more details uh, during, the, during the presentation. Okay, so let me start off with a motivation. And again, if people at the last, if they are not able to hear me, let me know if, if, I'm, if I'm not audible. So let me start with the motivation here. Um, so this is a different robot. Um, it's a fetch robot. It has one arm and it can move around. And what you're seeing on top is uh, a depth camera. So this robot is given a task of uh, perceiving the scene and sorting out the objects into two different bins. So you see a bin on the left side and the right side. So it's gonna sort out based off of uh, the identification of the object. And the problem domain is uh, only a subset of objects are of interest. Everything else is like a background or a noise. So we call that clutter. So the, so the goal here is perception um, and manipulation in Flutter. So this is robot in action. So there's a human who is gonna dump the set of objects on the table and the robot is perceiving, grasping and manipulating the objects and sorting it into these two bins. So this was a work that was done at Michigan uh, in 2017. This was from my uh, previous group. So you can see that there are failures and it recovers from that and tries to grasp it in the next, 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 uh, next, next pass. So you, you get a sense of what is the task here, right? Now let's look at how this is being done in terms of like perceiving, planning and action. So we run neural networks that kind of detects the bonding boxes of these objects. And we take these patches and there is a second phase where you are trying to reconcile based off of the 3D models of these objects that you already have. So you hypothesize many different poses and iteratively you convert to the pose um, uh, that is matching with the observation. And then the grasp is something that is uh, calculated offline. So we call that grasp pose estimation, but it is done offline for every 3D model. So once you figure out the pose, you know where to grasp the object. So you're seeing on, on the top left, like at every perceptual pass, it's doing the two stage detection followed by the pose estimation. So the detection part is mostly done by neural networks. Whereas the pose estimation, which kind of hypothesizes and refines the poses is done uh, using particle filters. So if some of you have taken already 5551, you might have know what a particle filter is, right? MCMC, Monte Carlo based localization. Uh, but we are doing it for a different domain. We are doing it for a perceptual domain. The observation is RGBD rather than the LIDARs that you would see in um, navigational problems. So we have come a long way from there. So this was 2017, right? After that, uh, people have worked on the bin picking. Um, there's an Amazon challenge that happened earlier. And so there's a lot of startups that came out in the recent years that does the bin picking really well. So they kind of figured out that you don't actually have to use grippers. You can just do that using suction. And then um, you don't need to know what the object is because if, you, if there is a pile of same, same set of objects in an industrial domain, you just don't need to identify what object is. It's, it's all the same objects. You just need to succeed in the suction and then you drop it in the different location. According to me, that's not manipulation. It's pick and drop because it's the, the action space is kind of uh, 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 changed. So in that line of work, more recently, um, I, I saw this work in May of 2022 at a conference and they, they had it lively, uh, live working on a real robot. So I'm not gonna go into the details of the techniques here, but I wanna give you a sense of uh, the fact that this is not uh, same as what you saw earlier. So there is no two-phase, there is no identification followed by 
pose estimation, it is directly finding out what to grasp and how to grasp it, and it just does it. So this is happening object agnostic way, meaning it does not know if that is a mustard bottle or if, if that is a, a flyer and so forth. It just knows that, okay, I can grasp this particular location in the, in the scene and I'm gonna go for it. And uh, the, uh, the reason I'm showing this particular work is that the robot starts to learn this from scratch, meaning initially it doesn't know what a, 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 a proper location for grasping is, but it does that over a period of time and uses contextual bandits like a reinforcement learning based work where it gets a reward for every action that it takes. And over a period of time um, in, an, in an online uh, learning setup, it kind of learns the grasping, um, how to grasp these set of objects. So what you're seeing here is that the, the success rate is increasing over the trials of uh, robot grasping these objects. So the cool thing is they can train the network or according to uh, whatever we have seen from the published work is that they can train a uh, robot in like one and a half hours. And it takes about 600 grasps for training that. And once it has trained on a set of objects, they show that it can work on a different set of objects because uh, it is basically able to figure out the pattern of where to grasp given a pile of objects. Cool. I also wanna say that we have a dual arm setup in my lab, uh, which is Robotics Perception and Manipulation Lab. And Carl, who is, if you wanna raise your hand, who's sitting behind, uh, has been working with me from the previous semester. Um, so he got this demo working. Um, he's still refining. I haven't told him that I'm showing this video in the class, um, but you can see that it works. Right, so he 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 set up the environment. Um, he kind of repurposed their 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 method to make it work for our domain. Okay, so now jumping back, if you search in the Google for robotics learning, grasping, or whatever, there's so much happening. So you'll see a lot of results, and this was not the case when I was in the grad school. This happened because of a lot of things, like the robots are getting cheaper and cheaper. If you have attended my talk like last semester, I, I talked briefly about that, like how the price of the robots is decreasing. And uh, because of the deep learning and uh, the ability to share the code across easily, um, this, is, this is exploded in a different way. Meaning people have started uh, coming up with their own startups and trying to um, minimize the complexity for, for for doing some of the more interesting things in a more general way. And uh, the course is actually about trying to let you guys um, understand the fundamentals so you can judge the work that is coming off in this particular space. And to give a different snapshot, so this on the research community, um, so ICRA is an international conference in robotics and automation. And in 2019, I don't have the, the most recent data. <clears throat> they kind of ranked or like sorted out based off of 10 subjects. And you can see that the number one with large amounts of appearance in the conference is basically deep learning in robotics and automation. And this has been growing over the period of time. And that is why we are having this course. <clears throat> so once again, welcome to uh, Deep Rob. Um, like I mentioned, this is being offered at Minnesota as well as at Michigan. So here I'm offering it as a special topics, more like um, uh, it has a little bit of projects and as I mentioned as well, but the intention is to get you also exposed to advanced uh, research topics at, uh, in this particular area. At Michigan, they have it as an undergrad and grad level course. So they have about like 120, 120 students who are taking the class. So it's, it's the largest class at Michigan. Um, so again, I'm Karthik Desing, if I have not introduced yet. Okay, so how did this course come up? So this is actually a fork and the star of um, popular courses at Stanford and Michigan. So if you search for deep learning for computer vision, you might actually see these courses. And a lot of people take this and the materials are out there. Um, we are kind of repurposing their materials. Um, 
and changed their projects so that it's deep learning for robot perception and not, not computer vision. Um, and trying to answer the questions in terms of what is it that is challenging in robotics as opposed to computer vision. Yeah. Okay. So a brief history of AI. I know you might have heard such kind of things from other courses as well, but I think it's good to have a different perspective. Like everybody brings their own um, perspective on that. So <clears throat> the AI was coined uh, during a Dartmouth conference over a summer in 1956. Um, anybody has heard about this before? Okay, so the, the, uh, let me point you to two people here, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky. They are like the founders of AI. And in fact, in 1956, um, they figured out, okay, let's pull in experts in this area and solve AI. And they just wanted to solve that over the summer. And uh, which is not the case, and we are still working on it, right? But, but it is good to know that it was started in 1956, uh, where people have started thinking about the idea of intelligence and how to impart that to an artificial agent. <clears throat> soon after, soon after they, they, they discovered that it's not gonna be an easy problem, so CP people have started working on this um, for, for years now. And what I would say is thinking through the entire problem. Like an expert would sit, figure out what is the problem, think about all the possibilities, and try to formulate that in different ways to come up with algorithms that would solve it. So this is done using expert systems back in the day, where there would be expert who would decide the outcomes of the system. Uh, and also the approaches that go behind it. Okay. So I think in close to 1990, people have started seeing the results um, emerging and being popular in the media. For instance, the image that you see here is, uh, I think from IBM, Deep Blue, where it's competing with a grandmaster in, in a chess competition. So I think that's when it started coming out into the mainstream and making a buzz. And as you all probably know that, you know, uh, over a period of time, we have it in all our devices, right? We have used AI in, in one way or the other for on your Google Maps, uh, which started out to going on to self-driving cars. And now people are working on that as well. So what is that on the top right corner? Let me expand that. So what you're seeing here is um, a map that was generated using LiDAR uh, mounted on a self-driving car. And this is actually Big House in Michigan. It's, it's a stadium, football stadium. And what you'll see here is um, the car being localized on the original map that was collected earlier. So they have stitched the map together, similar to what you probably have heard of in SLAM and stuff. And what is happening here is localization. And if you pay attention, uh, you can see that the sensor has the ability to get data of the environment. For instance, you can see the trees. Um, the intensity also gives you the, the markers on the road. And you can also see the bike list going across the street, right? So we have come to a point where there are sensors which are very sophisticated and algorithms that are like standardized to, to some extent that we are able to realize the self-driving cars. And right now the, the biggest bottleneck or biggest thing that people are figuring out is the corner cases, right? How does it work if you have a lot of pedestrians, if they're moving slow, if they are not following a particular pattern and so forth. So I think, I think that is what is, uh, we call as the tail end of uh, the cases. And uh, as you all know, the startup companies are still figuring it out. Oh, by the way, I should mention that this is done by Professor um, Edwin Olson and Ryan Eustace at University of Michigan. You'll see a lot of Michigan references because I graduated from Michigan, just so you know. Okay, so, so that was the first wave of AI where it started as a conference and then people started thinking about it and uh, expert systems were built. The second wave is uh, the rise of deep learning, which kind of happened around 2011. Um, the difference between these two waves is that the earlier wave is model-based, whereas the current wave is basically data-driven. 
um, it's uh, it's been proven again and again uh, that if you have large amounts of data, uh, you can come up with methods that can learn a lot of things and make uh, connections between uh, patterns in the in the in the data sets. So this happened with the advent of um, AlexNet. Um, and uh, in terms of computer vision, um, so deep learning is not only for computer vision, right? Like, but if you talk only about computer vision, we have seen uh, that it works on um, spotting pedestrians. And on the right, you can see that phase detection, it pretty much works off your phone, right? Like it, it's not an app, it just works on the hardware nowadays. So people are also working on hardware accelerators for a specific application so they can make the chip designs work um, uh, in a way that it is computationally faster. And I also want to point out this, this, this we, we might not cover this particular area um, in, the, in the class, but it's definitely exciting to see. So uh, what you're seeing on the left side right now is DALI. This is from OpenAI. Um, so they kind of worked on this aspect of visual language. So they found features in both these spaces and tried to learn common embeddings. And a bit, as a result of that, what they're able to do is if you give a text prompt, it's able to generate images. And there is stable diffusion which came after this. So I would, I would uh, uh, encourage you guys to look it up like DALI2, then stable diffusion. If you're interested in this aspect of text to uh, images, and there's also text to uh, videos, text to 3D. So this, this space is exploring, uh, exploring in terms of uh, content creation. So you can imagine in the future, you don't need a camera, a tripod, or multiple people to actually do something. If you can capture with your camera and if you have a model, you can just like put them in there on a particular content. Um, it's scary sometimes, but it's, it's, it's gonna happen. And then uh, Copilot, how many of you have heard about Copilot before? Or have you guys used it already? Okay, any experiences that you wanna share? I have not used it. Yeah, that's what I just posted on my group, right? <laughs> is it? I put Copilot on my IPC, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. It's like including, I write a comment, and then it writes me the lines that people can comment. So the experience is good so far? Yeah, so far so good. Okay. So there you go. So VS Code has Copilot. It probably comes as a plugin that you can just install. Um, yeah, so that's that's good for programmers. So you don't actually have to get stuck with the stencil. You can actually have uh, have the system generate the stencil for you. And talking about that, I'm sure you have heard about ChatGPT. If not, please please go and look it up um, because uh, if you are a master's in robotics or master's in computer science, uh, I think it, it's 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 good to know about these techniques that are coming out making revolution. Um, uh, ChatGPT. Uh, I was surprised and also shocked, um, but it's good. It, it gives you the content, but let me also ta talk about the flip side of it in a bit. Um, <clears throat> but before going to that, uh, I want to like go towards like what happened to deep learning before 2011. So it's not that it just happened in 2011. People have been working on this idea for a long period of time. So 1958, uh, Rosenblatt came up with the idea of perceptron, which you probably are hearing a lot in uh, the most modern neural networks like multi-layer perceptrons and so forth. So that was developed in 1958 or the idea came up in 1958. And in 80s, people have seen that it can work on speech data, um, but it was still happening mostly on the research side. I think 2011, what actually happened was the CNNs. Like we started using visual data and that's when it started exploding. And before that, it's, it's not that the idea was not there. It's just that we didn't have the computational power or the, uh, or the, uh, the architecture to actually make that happen. Okay. Going fast, slow, good. Okay. Okay, can anybody caption this um, image? Go for it. Salmon in water. Any other guesses? 
salmon hot oil. One more. Salmon swimmings in the spring. Did you see this already or what? <laughs> um, so it's actually, then you give this text to stable diffusion or DALI. Um, we saw that it generated this particular image, right? It's not wrong, right? It, it's, it's correct. It's a salmon, probably not swimming the, in the water, but it's in the water. And you can see that the, the images are actually more realistic. It, it looks like if somebody threw a salmon into the water, it's gonna look like that with all the ripples and everything, right? But we are not looking for that. We are looking for uh, fresh salmon swimming in the water. Um, so this, is, this, this tells you that if you know about something and you're using an AI, it's great. You can ha get a help of, from, from the AI system to speed up the productivity of your task. But let's say you don't know the subject and you're asking the AI, there's no way to figure out if that is right or wrong at this point. It's gonna, it's gonna like chat GPT is gonna convince you that it knows everything. So I, I, I went into the rabbit hole. I was doing a multiple searches on chat GPT. And, and at some point my friend came in and said, okay, why don't you search for this? And I didn't have any, any idea about that. But then I completely believed in the output until my friend told me that it was wrong. So, so be mindful about how you use uh, AI. And this is one uh, example of uh, what could go wrong. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one. Um, so yeah, so now that is not a critical application, right? You asked for something and you gave an image. So nobody was put in danger. But let's say you deploy these kind of algorithms on self-driving car and you trust it for, for many reasons. There could be a data point or a distribution that was not figured out in the training and it could go completely wrong. And we have seen some examples already in the past. So people are trying to come up with different methods to um, encounter that. So what you're seeing on the right side um, is an example where if you put many markers on the stop sign, it can go bad. It, it doesn't recognize that it's a stop sign. So people are also working on like trying to uh, figure out methods to hack the deep learning systems so they can come up with the reasoning of why things cannot work. Um, okay, so if you look at the landscape in terms of uh, the time period, so we saw, we saw the first wave, which was in 1956, the second wave around 2011. Uh, what could be the third wave? third wave, right? So I think it is about explaining the output of a deep learning system. That should be the third wave. Um, this is, there is a lot of effort in trying to uh, scale up the research on that particular end because it's most necessary when you're trying to deploy that onto a robotic system. Um, giving an example, for instance, let's say we are looking at this handwritten character. Um, if somebody asked me, I would take a guess saying nine, right? Even if you take a guess in this class, we might have a distribution of, you know, people raising hands for four uh, and also for nine. What uh, the, we want or we expect the system in the future to do is that the ability to explain the outcome, saying, okay, I think it is four because I think this is how the character must have been written. So that is what we want. We want the explainability uh, um, of, for these deep learning systems, which I believe is what would happen in, in the future. And there's a lot of effort like DARPA. I don't know if you heard about DARPA before, um, which kind of, uh, kind of propels research in a particular direction. And they have been thinking a lot about this, 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 uh, this question. Okay, so in terms of this course, I'm gonna be focusing on this aspect where we will learn some techniques of using deep learning, specifically for robot perception. Uh, we'll be using CNNs or the learning techniques that can actually take uh, image or visual input. Um, if you're interested on the first wave, I'm sure there are other courses. I think we have introduction to AI and advanced AI courses. I think they will cover the model-based AI techniques. Um, and this is currently the research aspects of 
artificial intelligence overall. So people are trying to move away to explainable AI. Okay. So coming back to the course, um, let me give you some uh, pointers. So there's a course website. Um, if you have received my Canvas announcement, um, uh, so most of the most of the things will be happening on the website. So the Canvas will, is only being used for sending announcements. Um, and there is a great scope that is linked to Canvas. Uh, let me talk about that a little later. So yeah, the course website has everything. It has syllabus, calendar, project files. Um, I'm gonna like upload slides after every lecture and uh, post video maybe after a couple of lectures um, and then links to resources and everything. Uh, we'll be using Edstum, which is a discussion board um, for communication and questioning. Um, you are not gonna lose much if you don't use a discussion board, but it, I think it's, a, it's, it's nice to talk to each other if you are if you're stuck on something, if you want to talk about a particular concept, and uh, I'll I'll talk about it some little later uh, to give more details on that. Okay, so this is the course web page. Um, please bookmark that. So so I know the link is quite large, but like try to bookmark that. And uh, as I said, uh, Michigan is also offering, so they have a different website for them, and they are like two weeks ahead of us. So don't get confused with the website. Okay, so back. Okay, so meeting logistics, you're all here, great. So you know where to come. Um, it's happening Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2.30 to 3.45. Um, Zoom links will be made accessible under special circumstances. If you need to access uh, the class or Zoom for any reason, you have to email me. Um, if I get an email before 2.15, I will give you the, the meeting link for the, for the class. And this will be done for every lecture. So there is no fixed Zoom link for the, the classes. I basically want to encourage people to come to the class. And it's, it's a small class, so uh, that's the reason for that. Um, office hours uh, will happen Wednesdays and Fridays, 2, 2 to 3.30 and 9 to 10.30. It happens in Shepherd Labs, 161. There is a conference room. And for office hours, you can opt to come on Zoom. So that's the meeting ID for um, the office hours. All these details is there on the website. You don't have to make a note of it. Um, cool. So I'm trying to organize the office hours queue a little bit. Um, maybe it's not necessary, but you can join the queue. If there are many people, please join the queue. And you can view what is your position in the queue by just clicking on the on the link. So this is on the website, by the way, so. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the object of this course is to uh, uh, kind of give you the computational skills to understand deep learning, um, like all the basics, like in terms of coding and everything, and being able to uh, replicate or re-implement the emerging uh, techniques. So you can, you can choose a particular paper and say, that's, that's my final project. Uh, so the, the, the class is completely project focused, so there is no exams. Uh, we'll have quizzes. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so the course structure looks like this. You have two halves. The first half is basically on fundamentals. So you will learn how to implement uh, your own neural networks, train them, debug them. Um, we'll start off with classifiers to fully connected uh, neural networks to CNN. And uh, the second half will be on uh, the emerging topics. So we'll be talking about different neural network architectures that's being used in robotics. Um, some hot topics in this area, like 3D perception, pose estimation, nerfs, neural radiance fields, which is, which is I'm really excited about that topic. Um, transformers, uh, it's a different architecture. It's not like CNN. And then grasp learning and tactile perception, which is which is grounded more on the robotic applications. So we will we'll discuss papers and research topics on these areas. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Um, in terms of implementing like a paper for final project, I'm assuming MEP or students won't have access to like a robot, so how, how do you envision those being implemented? Right, so not all the papers have robotics component to it. Um, sometimes they stop with robot perception. They know that 
a particular outcome is necessary for doing grasping or manipulation or navigation. Uh, but I would still like call them as robotics papers because they're thinking about the application. So you could work on data sets. Um, for the final project, they're trying to get access to the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. So you would have access to computing um, for, for doing your project. And uh, of course, like we have robots in our lab, uh, depending on uh, the groups and what they choose, um, we can figure out something uh, on working on the robots. Okay. So the website has calendar. You should, you should keep looking at it because I'll update it and it'll be the most updated thing uh, for the class. So it'll have lecture slides, um, resources for discussion, um, readings, and also schedule, downloads, project files, and everything. So please follow uh, the, uh, the course webpage. Okay, project topics. So project zero, which is already released. Uh, if you go to the website, you should be able to see that. Um, it's an introduction to Python, PyTorch, and Colab. Uh, I know we had a, a, a prerequisites for this course, which means I'm, I'm assuming that students have some exposure to Python or PyTorch in the other courses. So you should be able to complete that project zero really fast. And if you are facing issues, you should let me know and we should discuss. Uh, project one is going to be uh, not a neural network. It's like classification using K nearest neighbors. So we're gonna, like, we're gonna slowly jump off from PyTorch um, to use um, Python for, for KNN and, uh, and also classification using linear models. So no neural networks at that point. So project two is when you'll start like implementing your own neural network. So you'll start off with um, classification using fully connected neural network followed by CNNs. Yeah? Yes. Will that be from scratch or using PyTorch? Um, it'll be from scratch, but you'll use PyTorch like um, tools and we will tell you what to not use. Project three, we will go towards detection. Um, so classification to detection uh, using CNNs. I think this is where you would probably be looking into uh, state-of-the-art techniques like mask RCNN or faster RCNN and try to implement that. Um, uh, and project four, we will jump on to uh, state estimation, which is dis determining the pose of an object or a robot in this case um, using deep networks. And after that, we'll jump into the final project, which has many components to it. So we will let you figure out a particular paper that you're interested. Uh, you can give like ranking that I'm interested in this one, this one, this one. And at some point we'll, we'll figure out like how to allocate that among the students. And this involves paper review. Uh, we will also learn how to read a paper, how to read a technical paper, what to look at it, and how to write a gist in, in a few paragraphs. So that's gonna happen. Followed by a presentation. Uh, I think I have a slide that talks about final project a lot. Um, so presentation, so this will be done in groups. Um, so we can have teams up to three people. Um, so presentation and then reproduction of that particular paper followed by extension, because I, I think that's a good way to think about what can you do on top of an existing work. Um, followed by writing a report of your findings. Um, so these are all the variables. So you'll be doing review of the paper, which is a written format, and then presentation in the class. Because the second half, I won't be giving any lectures. It's all presentations from the students. And the results on the reproduction. Um, and you can extend the ideas and support, uh, submit a report on, on your findings. So the way I envision is if, if people are looking into um, getting research exposure after this class, I think this is a good stepping point where you can like think about a particular area of uh, work re-implement a particular paper, and then see how you can extend and you know think about that as your capstone or thesis project. It doesn't have to be with me, but you can find other faculties where you can say, I've done this for this course, and I wanna extend that to be a thesis or a capstone project. Okay, um, the grading for the projects, project zero to four, um, 
I'm going to use something called AutoGrader, which has not been set up at Minnesota yet. So that's why you won't find that find the details about that on the web page uh, uh, right now. Um, I'll send an announcement of, of that um, in a few days once that is set up. But <clears throat> Project Zero Four, uh, they're going to be graded automatically. Um, and you have two late days. Uh, please use them um, in case you know you fall sick or in any emergency situations. Uh, but I would say try to not use them early on, like because you might need that for project three and 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 the final project. Um, because initial projects are going to be like somewhat simple, unless you have emergency, right? Like so so. So late days is given just because you know people have issues and and, and we want to accommodate that. Um, beyond that, you'll have a twenty five percent penalty after the after the late days. The final project will be actually graded by me, and I want to have a system where people can vote on the presentations and the reviews and uh, the final uh, video or the report on, on that stuff. So so that will be done mostly manually. It's not going to be automated. Okay. Um, okay. I, I know people have emailed me asking about the grading policy. So projects zero to four, the five projects will have 12% 12, 12 each. And the final project will take 24%. And like I said, all of these components will have their own percentages. And there is a pre-lecture quiz, which will start from fourth uh, lecture. Um, so the plan is we will open the grade scope on the day of the lecture in the morning around 7 a.m. And you'll have time till the start of the class, which is till 2.30. And this is just like Boolean questions, like either yes or no questions. It should not take more than two to three minutes. But we will give a window of 15 minutes once you start the start the quiz and you should able, be able to submit it. And this will be based off of the previous lecture. If you follow the previous lecture, this should be easy to, to answer. So it is kind of spread up, spread across all the lectures. So you can see it's like 16%. Um, yeah. And I will make an announcement before I release it. It, it won't be like, it won't just come off. Okay. Collaboration policy, yes, all work should be submitted. Uh, all work that you submit should be your own. Um, we'll be following uh, the honor code from College of Engineering. And uh, like it says, no code can be communicated, even verbally. Um, and if you use any resources outside, and if you looked at it at a particular paper or stack overflow or some discussion, please do point out. Um, and if you have a doubt whether to use certain thing or not, ask me. And we definitely encourage free flow of discussion, especially on EdSTEM. You, are free, you can feel free to answer questions that is posted by Michigan students, and they can also answer your questions. And we wanna see this collaboration happening. Like maybe it will create a possibility to do a final project together with somebody who is at Michigan. So, so just, just, just letting you know. Okay, so that's uh, leading to the Edson discussion. Again, the signing up to this is optional. We are not forcing the students to sign up and use this. Because uh, the FERPA policy says you should keep it as uh, as willing of the students. So, so we are going to have a Google form. This is on the syllabus page of the website. If you want to be part of the EdSTEM discussions, um, like give a, give your acknowledgement on this form, and I will add you to the EdSTEM board. Um, yeah, so Michigan lectures are two weeks ahead. So if you join the EdSTEM, don't be overwhelmed because they might be talking about linear classifiers and all that stuff. But we have tabs in the in the EdSTEM. You can go to a particular lecture and see what people have asked before. So you might be uh, having the same issues or questions about lectures or projects as well. So we are using the same projects. So feel free to look it up, um, what our people have posted earlier and see if, the, if those solutions apply to you. And you should feel free to post your question. Um, uh, and the discussion of quizzes is, is not allowed because we are off by two weeks. So they are not gonna discuss. I would like you guys to do the same thing. So don't, don't discuss uh, quizzes or code. 
And you can do that in private. So I can see it, the other instructors can see it and they mm -hmm. can respond. Um, so, so yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, so the project zero is released. Um, so at Michigan side, they have a discussion session because it's a large class and they are also trying to accommodate undergrads um, in, in their course. So they have a discussion session and I will point to the discussion session on every Thursday. So which will be relevant at that point for our classes. So you can look at the discussion session and see if, if uh, those details help you. But my lecture should cover pretty much everything that you require for doing the projects. Yeah. Okay. And originally they were not planning on posting that uh, discussion, but um, I think it's 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 good to have. So uh, we are doing that anyways. Okay. So the next, uh, so the uh, the project zero is due on Tuesday, which is one week from now, um, on twenty fourth in the night, eleven fifty nine, and uh, I will send a link to so you can make a submission. But you can get started on the project without without that. Okay, so it's basically going to be on Colab. Um, if your people are familiar with Google Colab, anybody who is not familiar with Google Colab, yeah, it, it's 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 basically a nice way of looking at all your Python scripts. You have a script followed by the results, and the documentation is done very well. So you you should be able to, and it, it accompanies a Python code that you would implement. So. Um, the discussion link that I'll post on Thursday would help you if you are facing any issue with Colab. And of course, you can come to my office hours um, for, for, for that. Okay, so research topics. So you will see that there is a long list of papers on the, the papers tab on the website. And we are we are super excited about this. Both both me and like the other instructors, we are super excited because this kind of curates all the hot topics in the in the area. So let me give a uh, um, uh, overview of that. So we are going to discuss RGBD architectures, which is not often done in a vision course. Um, so RGBD, red, green, blue, followed by depth channel that comes out of uh, uh, RGBD sensors. Um, so we're going to see how to use that data in the CNNs to, to predict something that like classification or detection or post estimation. Um, and then we are going to talk about point cloud processing, or one of you is going to talk about point cloud processing, uh, where we will cover a gist of papers on point net, point net plus plus, and how to process point cloud data, which are not uh, visual data. We will also cover object pose, geometry, SDFs. SDFs are assigned distance functions and implicit surfaces. If you're, if you're not aware of any of these, do not worry. We will we'll go over that and we'll give, a, give, give an overview of that during, during the lecture. Um, followed by dense object descriptors. So we are going to describe a particular object in the scene so a robot can act on it. Um, there are many ways to do it. So object category level representations are one different way of describing objects. And uh, if people are already uh, familiar with tracking or being able to work on time series data, you want to be able to predict something over a period of time. So we'll talk about recurrent networks, which are used for, for, for those scenarios, and also discuss papers on object tracking. Uh, visual odometry and localization is another hot topic in uh, robotics. If you are moving around the space, you want to know where you are. And uh, this is done in many different ways. And we will talk about the visual uh, way of doing it so we can apply neural networks to that. And we will also talk about uh, semantic scene graphs and explicit representations. So for a robot, assume you want a robot at your home in the future, it should be able to work with several objects. It should be able to somehow represent the scene in a way. Uh, we will talk about few papers that does it in a, in a more um, uh, more explicit, explicit way. Uh, neural latency fields. I, again, this is this is a more recent hot topic in computer vision. Uh, there was a huge explosion that happened in the last couple of years, 
So I thought you guys should know about that. Like, so we'll cover this, this, this topic as well. And uh, we'll also talk about data sets. So in robotics, the one of the things um, that people often don't recognize is we don't have data. For computer vision, you can download data from the internet. For, ro for in, in robotics domain, either the only way it is possible is you have robot at every uh, location and you kind of accrue the data. So, so think about it, we don't actually have data and there is no way of defining what is the right data. For instance, for driving um, self-driving cars, the data might be different from the spot that you'll see in a bit. So, so we don't have a, a common huge repository of data for, for doing stuff. So we, for even Carl's thing, like he's collecting his own data and it's, it's learning uh, from the data that, that it is uh, collecting while grasping stuff. So I think data sets are a huge thing and it is good to know what is out there. People have done, um, made efforts to collect data so other people can use it. So there's a lot of effort that we need to collecting these data, especially for robotics. So we'll talk about that. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, uh, technique called self-supervised learning. And uh, more relevant to manipulation, we'll talk about how to do grass post detection in using learning techniques. And uh, I'm also interested in tactile perception because nowadays you have tactile sensors which are actually using camera behind the screen. So it gives you visual data which means all of the techniques that you learned, you will learn uh, using visual data should be should be applicable. So there is a bunch of work that that that's happening using tactile perception uh, because robots need to work with objects. We also need to know how it feels uh, if it is not able to visually perceive that particular object. Okay, so we'll talk about transformer architectures and other frontiers, which will deal with transparent objects, articulated objects, deformable objects, and so forth. So if somebody is interested in that space, um, they, they, can, they can present that and, and also discuss with other students. Again, we will not have lectures on these, but I'll work with students so they can prepare background and foreground for their presentations. Yeah, okay. We might not cover all of them, by the way, but but it's good to know that you have all of these things um, that we listed out that you can choose from. Okay, so next week we'll talk about, sorry, not, not next week, on Thursday, we'll talk about classification, um, uh, uh, image classification and linear classifiers. So with that, uh, that is the end of the lecture. We still have time. So I, I actually walked our uh, Hachi, Hachi is the name of the robot, uh, but this is a spot robot from Boston Dynamics and we have it in the class. So we can show you how the, the data stream is gonna look like. Um, unfortunately, people who are online today might not be able to see it, but I'm gonna let Baha um, connect to it. <laughs> 